Hi, we're back at the Bees and Honey podcast. Today we're speaking with Joy Seton, who works with natural dyes and has a print studio in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Joy has been a friend of mine for many years. Um, she's French, uh, I think by birth, and perhaps Swiss, and definitely American now. Um, she will describe her process of natural dye designs and hopefully we learn a little bit. I hope everyone's doing well and thriving in this uh, very challenging time. I think uh, like all creatives we have to find the good in this situation and use our time wisely. Okay, good. So I'm going to start and hopefully when we're done, it would have recorded. Oh my God. (laughs) Okay. So um, Joy, please uh, describe what you're working on right now. Um, What is your natural dye design and print studio? How does it work? So basically I make drawings, I draw patterns, and then I print them onto fabric using natural dyes and the silk screen technique. So Natural dyes have been used for thousands and thousands of years until they were replaced by chemical dyes in the late 19th century, which Uh took over everything. And most people stop using the natural dyes because they take much more time and effort. Uh But some people did maintain the old technique, particularly Uh in India, where it's still um, an industry. People still Uh do it more than just for their own crafting fun. And mm-hmm. also in Japan, they've, they've um, uh, not only do they still do it, but they've sort of pursued it, expanded it, industrialized it, come up with ways of uh, making uh, more mm-hmm. products, <laughs> more colors, more mm-hmm. color class, et cetera. So a lot of people think, oh, natural dyes are maybe very pretty, but they don't uh, stay on the fabric. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is not the case. First of all, chemical dyes also can um, fade when you wash mm-hmm. your dyes many times. They do fade. Mm-hmm. Um, and natural dyes, you know, some of them fade, some of them change uh, with time, but it's part of the, of the beauty of the color evolving. Right. So and quite- you st- Go ahead. No, it can it can be just as uh, durable as as chemical dyes. And we have we have fabric samples from uh, the time of the pharaohs, from ancient Peru, uh, mm-hmm. beautiful colors that are still very vivid mm-hmm. today. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, I really don't know much about this topic, so I'm happy to speak to you and learn something about it. You mentioned India and Japan, and what about your trip recently to Nigeria to the? Uh, to the indigo pits there. Yes. So my idea, first of all, to start making uh, textiles with natural dyes came when I was in Japan uh, about one year ago, just mm-hmm. visiting the museums and seeing the beautiful kimonos and beautiful patterns and colors they had made throughout the centuries. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. going to department stores and seeing that they were still producing things for commercial purposes with natural mm-hmm. dyes. And mm-hmm. that really impressed me. Uh, mm-hmm. I've always loved textiles and fabrics, and I started mm-hmm. to doodle patterns. Mm-hmm. And then when I, when I thought of, okay, well, how will I make them? Uh, the first thing that came to mind was that they should be natural. Mm-hmm. Um, the fashion industry, clothing and dyeing, is one of the most polluting industries in the world mm-hmm. uh, because they use disgusting chemicals and because they figured out how to make it so cheap that Mm -hmm. uh, people just buy and throw away buy and throw away every season or uh, right maybe even faster than that and that Mm -hmm. is quite repulsive so Mm -hmm. i I want to make things that will uh, that will stay that will be so beautiful that there's really no reason to throw them away and even if you do right you can put them in a compost pile and they will uh, not um, make the earth around them toxic. Yes. So tell us uh, how, uh, in general, I know this was the start in your mind of what you would be working on for the next year, 
But how did the previous tra- travels you had contribute to this whole vision as well? Like you mentioned India. I know you spent some time in the past in India. Yes, I've been to India a few times. Uh, but it was before I had a strong interest in, in textiles. I would still go mm-hmm. and just be impressed, first of all, by seeing everyone there wearing beautiful mm-hmm. textiles, women in stories, mm-hmm. and men, both men and women wear a, a lot, of, <laughs> wear their traditional clothes, and it makes mm-hmm. them look very elegant, very proud. Mm-hmm. Very beautiful. And the same thing in Nigeria when I went mm-hmm. last, uh, well, no, oh, only two months ago, indeed. I know. <laughs> only two months ago. It seems so long ago, when right? We yeah, still I know. Travel, so long really. ago. Uh, and that's mm-hmm. also a place where a lot of people wear traditional clothes and it just looks good. I think it makes people feel prouder. They stand taller and they look beautiful. Mm-hmm. Also because the, it's uh, a lot of what they wear is tailor-made, they buy the fabric, mm-hmm. they buy their beautiful mm-hmm. white prints, of which there are mm-hmm. hundreds of different, thousands of different patterns, and then they go mm-hmm. to the tailor and have a suit made just for them. Mm-hmm. And maybe they have only one or two suits, but they look very, very handsome mm-hmm. in their suits. <laughs> well, you just reminded me of something, you know, uh, this artist, uh, Nick Cave, I think he's with Jack Shaneman Gallery. Uh-huh. He does a lot of uh, work with this African fabric on these uh, large scale sculptures or models of uh-huh. the human form. So uh, you just reminded me of him when you mentioned that. Yeah. Um, but tell me, you know, this whole bespoke uh, material uh, patterning and uh, garment creation. Yes. When when you were in Nigeria, um, you pointed out that some of these things that they were selling to Africans were not even made in Africa. I didn't even know that before you uh-huh. mentioned that. Yeah. So, some of them were made in China for the African market. Oh, or something yes. Like that. Yeah. Yes. So the textile trade, first of all, is one of the oldest trades in the world. We have been exchanging textiles for millennia, and India. Mm-hmm in particular, has been making textiles for the whole world for millennia. There are Indian textiles in uh, in ancient Egyptian uh, excavations that are thousands of years mm-hmm. that were traveled, mm-hmm. that traveled throughout the Silk Road and was, were sold, you know, in the Middle East and everywhere. Uh, and mm-hmm. then already at that time, were making certain things for themselves and then certain things for mm-hmm. the export market. They learned... You know, what Indonesians liked, what Chinese liked, what Middle Eastern people liked, and they would make certain colors, certain patterns for the different markets that they were selling to. Mm-hmm. And it just continued. Then the Europeans did that too when they, uh, they uh, first of all, uh, what some of what, what the English did uh, to textile industries in all the countries that they, that they colonized is quite repulsive and uh, very, very aggressive. Uh, they would come to places like Nigeria, that's or the, the, the western coast of Africa, which was making its own cotton, weaving its own cotton, dyeing, etc. And they would actually mm-hmm. crush, you know, they consciously crush the industry so that they could sell their, their fabric from Manchester. And also they did the same in India. They would uh, tax... Indian fabrics made in India so that so that it became too expensive for Indians to buy them and then sell mm-hmm. their own things that were exported thousands of miles were actually cheaper mm-hmm. to buy than Indian textiles. Um, but to go back to the, the wax print, the story mm-hmm. is that uh, it's, um, it's uh, some Indonesian type, uh, Indonesian type patterns that were found to appeal to, to people in Africa. And mm-hmm. so, you know, different European firms starting to make them in large quantities to sell them there. Swiss firms, Dutch firms. Uh, but some of them are made in Africa and some of them are made in Indonesia, in China, in India, all over. Right, mm-hmm. interesting. <laughs> but what, <laughs> what was... Yeah. Uh, and some... Some tourists like myself might unknowingly purchase them thinking yeah. they were buying authentic. But at the same time, it, does, it doesn't really matter because it's very hard to to figure out what is actually authentic because there has been exchange going on between all the cultures for so long that mm-hmm. things have always been mixed. It's There are very few 
places that that uh, that do exist in a bubble without uh, without trading and getting ideas from others. So most things are, you know, a mix of influences, and that's what these wasp prints, these African wasp prints, are also a mix of influences. Right. Well, I'm going to ask another question, which is a bit more uh, personal. I'm mm -hmm. going to ask, I said, uh, both you and your uh, twin are very creative and do what I guess would be called the practical arts or mm -hmm. in old old fashioned terms, craft. I don't like that distinction, but how do you classify your work if you classify it at all? Yeah, uh, I love craft. <laughs> so it's not at all insulting to be called a craft uh, mm -hmm. because I find there's great pleasure in making things with your hands. And I mm -hmm. think you don't really understand what you're making until you make it with your hands. For mm -hmm. example, I started to draw patterns on paper, but then when mm -hmm. it comes time to make them in fabric, you realize that certain patterns are more adapted to certain techniques. And then mm -hmm. you learn how to, so right now I'm using silk screen, so I'm learning how to adapt my visual ideas to be, to be um, more adapted to the silk screen. And then if I was weaving, it would be a whole different type of, of design. So I find that you really learn about, about what you're designing when you mm -hmm. know the, the material that it will be made in. Uh, and as you mentioned, so some people really make a difference between the fine arts which are, I think, painting, sculpture, and architecture, and then mm -hmm. everything else, <laughs> the decorative arts. Um, I really li I like all of them, and mm -hmm. I love the decorative arts. Uh, I like them because of their, uh, sometimes just because of their portability, is that they're smaller objects, lighter objects that you can have on you, that you can mm -hmm. take with you. So mm -hmm. there's something quite... Uh, nomadic in me and and my sister too maybe because we have some jewish egyptian roots where people <laughs> of the desert people who are on the move and yes. it tends to have our, our goods be portable so she designs gold jewelry now mm -hmm. i'm designing fabrics it's things that you can carry on your back and always have with you like yes. a tent or a blanket or things like that that are that provide great visual uh, beauty and, Pleasure. Light, and that you can roll up and take with you. Yeah, uh, much better than a Picasso painting, uh, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Which I guess you can also <laughs> take off from the frame and, and roll up. I guess, yes, yes, yes. I guess so, you're right. But um, also, so, so these mm -hmm. things, also it's considered primitive. It's considered primitive to be into these kinds of very portable um or adornment, the adornment mm -hmm. to, to really like to adorn yourself. But there's mm -hmm. some joy in, in broadcasting um, your, um, your visual sense and also certain symbols and meanings. Like when I design a pattern, it has a certain meaning, sometimes with words and sometimes just uh, with, uh, with more figurative images is that it means yes. something, it has a symbol, it's, you can see it and instantly or not instantly, but, uh, you know, gather some meaning from it. And that's what my sister does too. She uses symbols. And that's what mm -hmm. people have done, uh, you know, for thousands of years, tattoos, uh, any kind of adornment usually has some meaning to it. And yes. nowadays, <laughs> nowadays in the cities or the urban uh, industrial modern people, they can do it through brands or through mm -hmm. sport teams, t-shirts and caps with sport teams. Um, I happen to not wish to have an, those kinds of affiliations, particularly through brands and status. I'm not very interested in that. But there are other things that can be broadcast through color and, and adornment. And do you have, besides yourself and your sister, do you have a history? I know you said you have these roots in uh, perhaps the, these traveling bands. But uh, is anyone else in your family uh, creative stuff like your mom, your dad, your aunts, your uncles? I yeah, know. absolutely. So the most direct inspiration is my aunt, who is a painter, a potter, and now textile designer. Mm -hmm. um, she's so she has always made things, uh, paintings, pastel, and and ceramics that she glazed and. Um, and then recently, quite recently, she started to make uh, patterns for textiles that she made in India and that she sells in Sardinia. And mm -hmm. they're just uh, the most uh, whimsical, fun, colorful. 
and uh, unusual prints. And I've, seen, I've never seen anything like them. And so when I started to draw it, it's completely in that vein. It uses humor and color. And um, to take, it draws on certain, um, certain tropes, let's say, of, of mm -hmm. textiles like stripes or squares or whatever. There are certain formats that are used on textiles, but they are always, I always try to use them in more, in the, uh, in a meaningful, to, to tell a sort of story or to broadcast a, a certain message. Yes. So right. yes, my aunt is the most direct inspiration because I, I ended up doing exactly what she's doing, which is make textiles. Um, she makes them in India. I chose to do them in America, mm -hmm. um, partly because I have three small children, so I can't take them all to India to work in a, in a workshop there. I wanted right. to have my workshop here. And also, there is a great joy in, uh, like, if I had gone to make the fabrics in India, it would all have mm -hmm. been there already. The workshop, the experts, uh, the the artisans would have been there. Here, right. I sort of have to not make it up because I did find one expert artisan that I'm working with and learning with. Uh, mm -hmm. But we're basically, we set up our own studio. We are experimenting ourselves. It's, it's very hands-on. And for me, it would be, I would be very happy if I could then expand that, teach it to others and have a real uh, cottage size industry going on here where other people can, can partake and learn these te techniques that are very uh, enjoyable. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Your studio is in Red Hook? It's in Gowanus. It's in Gowanus, right. And you collaborate with a few people like this other person who is your... Yes. Um... Hannah Schulz, who is an mm -hmm. expert buyer and screen printer, uh, mm -hmm. is my main collaborator. Mm -hmm. uh, part of our process right now is that... So I make a drawing and she helps me make the screen and print it. And it, it, it involves everything, uh, making the dyes, making the inks to print, making the screens, preparing the fabric. There are many, many steps that I'm learning with her. Uh, so at this point, I know some of them, so I can, I can make some of my own fabrics. And then she does some. Sometimes we do it together. So yes, right now, one wonderful collaborator and... Uh, and so how 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 do you and when you make the fabrics how big is it like how much of it do you produce at any one time? We have an eight yard printing table, so that's mm -hmm. you know that's pretty long to to make mm -hmm. eight yards of fabric at once. It's pretty mm -hmm. long, but it's it's certainly not uh, industrial <laughs> size. Mm -hmm. uh, and the main thing that we will be producing in the studio is um, I'd like to make shirts sure beautiful blouses and shirts for men and women and for mm -hmm. example one shirt is two yards about two yards so we print eight yards at a time with only four shirts oh, okay. so the production the production is quite small um <laughs> and also since we since i have so many ideas for different patterns uh, each pattern takes a while to elaborate and perfect with the different colors. So once mm -hmm. you have one pattern done, you could keep printing and printing and printing, and it will go quite fast. But uh, what we're doing right now is, is printing you know, 10, 20, 30 yards of one pattern and then going on to another pattern so that okay. I can <laughs> have a variety of patterns to show. And then who's, who's buying this stuff? Where are you getting this stuff promoted or sold? Okay, so we were just reaching, it's been one year and we were just, we've been working on prototypes, samples, mm -hmm. etc., tests, and now we were just reaching the point where we would have some uh, product to sell, mm -hmm. which are shirts that are being made at a lovely third generation shirt maker in Newark, New Jersey, mm -hmm. Gambler Shirts. From father mm -hmm. to son, they, they make custom bespoke shirts and they have a small mm -hmm. also production uh, production line and they were going to make our shirts. Uh, we were waiting for samples uh, a few weeks ago, uh, but now, of course, the factory is shut and right. I don't know when it will be operational again. But for me, I still do have uh, yards of fabric to sell. Mm -hmm. 
people can buy the fabric and make their own garments or projects. Right. Although not that many people sew anymore, but maybe with the quarantine, uh, people well, will have well, more time to sew. Exactly. Well, where uh, would they find them? Like, is there a website? Or well, working work? on the website right now. It's on Instagram. Mm -hmm. and people can mm -hmm. contact me on Instagram. And I'm working mm -hmm. on the website to have everything displayed and shown to, to everyone. And what's the Instagram uh, handle? It's Seton J Textiles. That's S E T T O N J mm -hmm. textiles. So okay. there you can see some of my patterns. But I like to put some of my work and then also traditional work that I find beautiful and, and inspiring. inspiring. Yes. Yeah. So tell me, you didn't go into much about the indigo pits, but what did you learn there? What What is the indigo pits in Nigeria okay. about? <laughs> so I did go to, to the north of Nigeria mm -hmm. in a place called Kano where they have a dye work that has been in operation for 500 years, mm -hmm. where they dye with indigo. And indigo is what gives us the beautiful blue color mm -hmm. that has then been synthesized to make uh, blue jeans. We mm -hmm. used to have indigo. Uh, so this is a place with big holes in the ground, pits, where they mm -hmm. prepare the, the fermentation bat of indigo leaves and mm -hmm. ashes. Mm -hmm. And they dip the, dip the fabric in there uh, one time, two times, three times to make it darker. Mm -hmm. um, their hands are all blue. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then they use different techniques, uh, tie-dye. You know, they, there is some, the, the ladies there in the old city in Kano are sewing patterns onto the fabric to, uh, to make tie-dye. Then when it's dipped, then you take out the thread and there's a pattern of circles or different uh, motifs that appear mm -hmm. it's called it's a uh, so that was wonderful first of all to see uh, to see such an old place still operating mm -hmm. and uh, that hasn't been uh, rendered obsolete or put out of business by or commercialized by, yes yeah mm -hmm. uh, so yeah I'm uh, I'm I brought back some of those fabrics and I'm making shirts with that and I'll be importing more. I'm, I'm waiting. There were some issues with customs, but I'm basically trying to set up a small import business of those textiles, amongst others that will come later, because I really like the people there and the work that they do. Very, very nice. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I, I have a, a new relationship with Africa as well that I'd like uh -huh. to foster once we yeah. can actually move goods and services and people yeah. around again. Oh, goods are still moving. I received things from Italy, actually, in a, like in two days. That seems to yes. still be working. Yes. Um, <laughs> but it all yeah. seems so long ago, even though January is just like two months ago. How has your work changed since the lockdown? And uh, what else? I know you said production has probably slowed down. Production but, um, has slowed down, but the... Uh, the what I do is, since I can work alone or ju with just one other person, uh, mm -hmm. we're still able to work if we want to. Uh, mm -hmm. And since I chose to have it be right next to my house, it's still uh, access easily accessible. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it, it's uh, we were going to make shirts right now that's on, on standby. So some things are still working, some things no. Um, right. For example, our raw material is silk. We print on silk, which does come from China. And that had already started to slow down because of the trade war. So before the virus, already some of the silk poplin that I use was no longer available or mm -hmm. the price was rising because it was harder to import. Right. Um, and that's, uh, <laughs> you know, we used to make silk in America. In fact, in New Jersey, there was a town called Silk City, USA. Mm -hmm. But it's been decades that the last plant has closed. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a pity. I think there's nothing wrong with international trade. But I think that it's very nice for countries to make a little bit of everything. Well, so that I think <laughs> when mm -hmm. things like this happen, we yes. still have uh, the ability, first of all, because it's, usually quite pleasant to make things. I mean, mm -hmm. in circumstances, mm -hmm. maybe not in the, in, in the factory setting. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, I think it's a well, I, to, to have everything come from one place. 
Yes. Well, that's the thing. Everyone's talking about self-sufficiency now and bringing uh, work and jobs back to America. I mean, it's a great idea. Let's see if uh, people will actually do it. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. So tell me, you are French, right? I couldn't uh, decide if you were French or Swiss or both or... I know you're American now, but... Uh, yeah, I, but... I've been American since I was born. I was born in New York. Oh, okay, uh, okay. <laughs> my mother came to give birth here from France. Mm-hmm. So I have a French passport and an American passport. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my mother is of Swiss and Canadian descent, and my mm-hmm. father is Egyptian and French descent. Oh. Uh, but my brothers and sister and I grew up in, in Paris and then Switzerland. Mm-hmm. And then, the and then amazing. Yeah. I think uh, I really enjoy uh, your cosmopolitan nature, <laughs> you and your family. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to probably sign off now, but is there anything else you'd like to add before we're done? Yes, a little bit more about natural dyes, first mm-hmm. of all, is mm-hmm. that... Uh, um, so another big crafting inspiration is William Morris, the great mm-hmm. Designer uh, mm-hmm. of the arts and craft movement uh, from the turn of the century, and mm-hmm. he wanted to bring things back to being th- being made by hand and and also using. He was weaving and making carpets and and wallpapers and things. He also started to use natural dyes at a time when it was already obsolete. So at the turn of the last century, it was already sort of a crazy thing to do, mm-hmm. uh, and it's maybe even crazier to do now. But it just shows that, uh, you know, the things that he made are still beautiful today. And yes. so hopefully the things that I make will still be beautiful in, in 100 years. Um, <laughs> so Absolutely. That, <laughs> yeah. And also, so about what, about a little bit more about what I make is that I make, I, I print yards of fabric that can be used for making garments, but also for interior design. So mm-hmm. I if there are any designers interested mm-hmm. in this type of work, they can um, they can purchase some of my fabric that that I've already printed. Or I'm also very interested in in working on commission, and mm-hmm. that also brings us back to the idea of crafts. Is that crafts people usually uh, work uh, because you order something from them, you give them a mm-hmm. commission, just mm-hmm. like you used to do. In fact, to painters in the Renaissance, they also worked on commission. Right. Uh, but I'm very uh, eager to work with people who want a particular pattern, a particular color for uh, for wallpaper, for pillows, or for a wedding dress, whatever, special, mm-hmm. special commissions. Events, we, can, yes. we can work with special patterns. Yes. Okay, well, I have two people that just came to mind. I'll get in touch with you after <laughs> okay. we're done with the call. But yeah. uh, maybe you know Pierre Frey. I don't know if his style. Yeah, I you... do. I do. Yeah. So get in touch with Pierre. I think he's very open to like contemporary designs I was in on class, his fabrics. I was in school with uh, Pierre. Some Frey boys uh, when I was uh, in college. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Them since. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm sure but you can find them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, and I'll I'll send you another link to a friend of mine. She's American, and she she used to work with the Gourney, and now she started her own uh, firm with okay. interior design fabrics. Yeah, yeah, cool. All right, so enjoy the day and stay well, and you know, I guess enjoy your children, enjoy your work, and yeah, hopefully, that we yeah, <laughs> and good. maybe we can enjoy our company again at some one day, dinner or party. One day soon, inshallah. Yes. Okay. Inshallah. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for joining you. me. Okay, bye. 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 Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Bees and Honey podcast. The next couple of weeks are probably going to be a little spotty in terms of what I'm able to cover and with who. Um, Thanks to technology, we can still carry on these podcasts remotely, but uh, in some cases it's not the same and uh, I would like to speak to some people uh, face to face who at this time I'm unfortunately unable to meet with. But um, please uh, continue to listen, 
join us if you have any suggestions for guests i'm happy to hear your suggestions you can find me at beesandhoney.com www.bees as in zebra a n d h o n e y.com or you can email me at nicolette at beesandhoney.com thanks and have a good week